Welcome to 101. I'm Rick Kaplan. My guest today is Dave Seymour. He's the CEO of Freedom Venture Investments, Inc. He's also the star of A&E TV's show, uh, Flipping Boston, and also a host of Real Estate Revealed Radio, uh, a radio show on Saturdays, 12 to 1 p.m. on the North Shore. That's 104.9 FM. Yeah. How are you, Dave? I'm well, I'm well, Rick. It's like my mom would be so proud of that resume. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, I'm so proud. Hercules, Hercules, Hercules. It, and I could go on and on, you know? Yeah, there, there's a little but more gonna, to But I'm going to let you tell me a little more about what you are up to today. Yeah, man, we're, we're, we're busy, Rick. We're busy. Uh, you know, we, uh, we are in a different world today. I think we can all agree with that. You know, in business with COVID and the, the chaos that that created in February, March. So, you know, our company pivoted. I was um, I was heavily invested in the lending space and um, moved out of that very quickly because Wall Street decided they didn't want to uh, buy uh, mortgages anymore. The kind of mortgages that we're, we're familiar with as investors, non you know, non QM, non owner occupied mortgages. So when that business ended abruptly, it was like, oh boy, right? What what's next? And um, what we decided to do was actually go back to my roots. Like you talk about, you know, flipping Boston and the TV show and, you know, all of that, uh, that silliness. And I, you know, I'm, obviously I have fond memories of, of flipping Boston. It's still playing on, uh, we're on Amazon Prime now, Rick. I'm, I'm, I'm in the big oh. leagues, man. <laughs> you can, wow. yeah, you can, I have yeah, Amazon you, Prime. <laughs> yeah, check it out. Just, just put flipping Boston in there and you'll see... Uh, You'll see all the episodes that we made. But, um, you know, I was, people have, have made that connection with me personally, obviously, to that TV show, which is kind of interesting, you know, to be in a men's room in in East, East wherever, you know, Timbuktu, and all of a sudden, hey, are you that guy from the TV show? No, man, I always tell him I was on America's Most Wanted, just, yeah. just, just, just a little distance. But anyway. Well, if you're um, in the men's room, I don't know what you want to tell them. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Leave me alone while I finish right, Finish uh, what I got to do here. But um, no, seriously, I was I was connected with, you know, that, that single family business of buy, fix and flip. But what the, the recognition never came for the fact that I was always uh, involved in commercial real estate. Uh, you know, the real wealth is really, as we know, is created through through real estate's long game, not its short game. You know, if you buy a house and fix it and sell it, it's a job, right? It's a well-paying job if you do it right, but it's still a job. Whereas, you know, wealth, the creation of wealth is through cash flow and appreciation, depreciation, tax advantages, and all the things that we know of. So when the lending business... Um, you know, kind of folded dramatically. Um, I, I looked at the landscape and kind of had one of those entrepreneurial moments where I said, he or she who controls the capital for the next 24, 36 months, two to three years, if you are a controller of the capital, I personally believe that you're going to really win this game, this opportunity that, that's been created. So um, I connected with a very dear friend of mine, a guy I've known for, for quite a few years, Walter Novicki. Uh, Walter is uh, ex-military, he's a couple of years older than me, over 30 years in, uh, in real estate. And um, Walter had been a, uh, a prolific syndicator. So buy commercial assets, you know, uh, reposition them, maybe ground up construction, and he had done the, the bulk of his um, career was in the uh, Gulf Coast region of Florida. So anyway, God is good. If you, if you say your prayers loud enough, you know, he, he replies and he listens. And uh, Walter and I reconnected. And it was a case of kind of like you just asked me, Rick. You know, he said, what are you doing? I told him my woes. I said, what are you doing? He said, um, you know, I can continue, David, to do one or two at a time. He said, I can continue to buy, you know, a 60-unit complex. You know, syndicate it, raise, you know, three, four, five million, you know, exit out four, five, six years later, pay my investors 10, 14 percent returns, 20 percent IRR. He said, I could do that in ones or twos. He said, or what I think um, is the most the most beneficial strategy, not only for us as investors, but also for the folks that invest with us. He said, let's put a fund together. 
And I know I kind of like answer in a long-winded form as I tend to do, Rick, but that's what we're doing today. We created a um, real estate fund with, with Freedom Venture Investments. Uh, we're a $100 million private equity fund. And what we, we're doing is, is we're raising that capital and then putting that capital to work in 40 to 140 unit apartment complexes in the Gulf Coast region of Florida. And we, we just simply cut and paste the same business model that worked for syndication. Now, instead of just buying one or two at a time, basically without sounding cocky or clever, we're trying to buy them all. As long as they meet our buying criteria and they meet our buy box. Um, so that's, that's what, it's funny, I've, I've kind of like, you know, I'm looking at the, the signage behind you, right? New York and New England real estate journal. But, you know, I would be, I would probably be um, a little off base if I said I, I felt like I was in real estate at the moment. I feel like I'm in finance because I spend all of my time, right? I spend all of my time talking about capital, capital stacks, LTVs, L2Cs, you know, cap rates, ROI, NOI, ABC, BBC, they, one, hey, two, three. They go hand in hand. They go hand <laughs> they in do. hand. They do. They do. They do. And um, there's something very gratifying, to be very direct and frank, there's something incredibly gratifying between pairing the very, very best real estate deals with, with accredited investor capital. Um, there's something that's just really gratifying when you can look, look at a, uh, an investor, show them your business model and show them how, you know, double digit targeted returns are not a, it's not a unicorn, you know, it's not a fantasy. And you know that from your experience, it's not a fantasy. It's just, it's been for the elite for so many, many generations that the opportunity to, to have that Walter calls them, um, what does he call them? Country club deals. He says, these are the deals that are usually put together on the 10th hole of the country club, right? Um, and to be able to put those kinds of vetted um, quality deals, you know, with a, with a solid history and track record behind the operators, which is us, uh, it's very gratifying. So that's what we're doing, man. We're raising so, money and spending. You know, I mean, it, uh, it's similar to what I call, especially in the New England and New York market, is yeah. the insider uh, yes. business. Because if you're an insider, you have all the, the great deals come along to you. You all, always have access to plenty of uh, funding. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. You know, yeah. But you're, you're, you're taking this more to uh, individuals. Yeah, yeah. So when you can't just say, okay, today I want to have a fund and raise money. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. So you, you have to be SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission compliant. Um, there is a lot of um, hurdles and expenses, to be very honest, that we, we have to go through to be able to have a fund that we can then market to the general public. Now, um, we work with accredited investors. Now, an accredited investor, I'm sure most of your, your listeners already know this, but for those that don't, I'll just give you the high points. An accredited investor is determined by the Securities and Exchange Commission. And they say an accredited investor has enough intelligence to be able to invest wisely is really basically what they're trying to say. And the way they determine that is based on an individual's income. So if you're a, a, an individual single earner, it's $200,000 a year or more. The SEC says you're accredited. You can look at these types of offerings that we have. If it's a family unit, it's 300,000, or it's a million dollars in net worth, not including a primary residence. So any um, valuable, uh, any other valuable items or any maybe any other real estate that has um, equity in it. So, you know, when you say individuals, yeah, but my, my investor pool has to be an accredited investor. And what we're finding is, is an incredibly large, and this is so interesting to me, an incredibly large amount of our capital is coming through what we call qualified funds. And qualified funds are the self-directed individual retirement accounts or the, one of the newer vehicles in the self-direction marketplace right now is a vehicle called a, um, a solo 401k. You know, we're all probably very familiar with the 401ks that were offered by employers. But a solo 401k um, has a, a much higher contribution amount of capital allowed 
Um, I'm over 50, so uh, I could put as much as $62,000 in contributions into one of these accounts every year. And obviously, and, that's and a, just, a tax just so people, structure. Just for people listening, it, if they do invest in that, uh, that is not penalized. Correct. Correct. What a solo 401k does is, uh, again, big picture, right? I'm not an accountant. I'm not an attorney. There's a disclaimer. I'm not a financial advisor. We do all of that stuff. But the big picture on a solo 401k is so powerful. If you're, say, maybe a business owner and um, a lot of people are looking and you will be looking a lot harder after November if it, if it goes the way it could potentially go. A lot of people are looking for ways to shelter tax exposure legally, right? And one of the ways to do that is a solo 401k. And, and what it means is one business and one business owner. So a lot of, um, say you're, um, I'll give you an example, you're a restaurateur, right? And well, they're not doing so well right now, but we'll use them as an example anyway. Say you're a restaurateur and you're sitting on four or $5 million in capital. If you opened up another business and called it your, your um, investment business for um, you know, an investment company, LLC, well, that company can then um, contribute $62,000 in my age group uh, of tax deferred or tax free capital into that retirement vehicle. That retirement vehicle, and this is where it gets to be so, so much fun. It's fun. It's fun watching it. That retirement vehicle, that solo uh, 401k, can then invest in, in my example, a, a private equity fund. And we target double-digit returns to our investors, 10 to 14%. They get the first preferred 6% rate of return. Over the life of the time that the money's working, we target anywhere between a 20 to a 22%, what's called an internal rate of return. So the question I put to these individuals, as you described them in the beginning, Rick, is as I say to them, what would your retirement look like if your money was going to work at a 10 to 14% targeted rate of return? What would it look like to be able to defer taxes on 62,000? Let's say it's 62,000 that's deferred at a 33% tax rate, right? Or a 25, somewhere in there is the average. How does that look now? That's protecting a protection or a deferment, a shelter of tax exposure of what, $20,000. Think about what some people have done in their lives to, to, to earn $20,000, and yet we can defer that. And look, it's not not paying taxes. I mean, real estate is the number one tax shelter strategy that I know of. I think if you lined up 100 you know, investors, I think 99 of them would know it's real estate. For some reason, only 20% of them are in real estate, though, because like you said, they don't have the right. They don't have the inside scoop. But when you start looking at that and you get to see, you know, accredited investors in their late 30s, 40s and then, you know, 50s and 60s. And they start looking at what's been going on with the fee structure inside their current retirement plans. And then they see what we get to offer them as investors. They, they you know, it's exciting. It's exciting to, to watch uh, to watch the impact that we can have on their on their lives and their retirements. But we want to leave some information on the table so when people do uh, see this, they they can contact you, Dave. We don't want to give it <laughs> I all. I it all up, man. I don't I don't hold anything back. <laughs> I don't so, hold anything. You know, so, you know what's so, so you know. Well, let's go into you know this this whole COVID system that has yeah. gone around the world uh, yeah. has affected so many different industries. Sure. Uh, what is what are some of the opportunities that have arose or arisen from arisen? Uh, yeah, COVID for you COVID, guys. COVID, yeah. Look, COVID has. Um, I compare and right or wrong, man. Look, I'm a. I say this a lot. I'm a blue collar guy in a white collar world, right? As you know, you and I have a friendship and, and there, not so many years ago, maybe 15, 16 years ago, uh, you know, I was fighting fires in the city of Lynn, Massachusetts, um, you know, a paramedic. So when I start looking at the journey that I've taken, I bring a lot of blue collar attitude to a white collar world. And what I mean by that is, is that I focus heavily on fundamentals. And what I mean by that is, is I compare the, the, the easy data that's in front of us 
And what I do is, is I compare 2007 and eight, right? To where we are today in the sense of a massive um, shift or change or, you know, crisis, whatever label we want to, we want to give it. You know, the real estate marketplace 2008 was driven by Wall Street's greed. We all know that. We don't have to debate it or discuss it anymore. But what happened in 2008 was, was the wound was, was made and it was allowed to bleed. It was, it was a full-on crisis. It was a full-on foreclosure crisis, evictions, et cetera, et cetera. Capital um, shrunk, lending shrunk, credit shrunk. And it went into that full, you know, it was almost a lockdown in and of itself. But the consequences of that was a three to five year recovery and then another five years of growth, okay? The, the data, all the, the intelligent economists will give you plenty of data to back that synopsis up. So what does that mean? Your question is the COVID crisis and the opportunity. Well, here's, here's the big difference and then here's the similarities. The big difference is, is that COVID has created a real estate crisis, which is yet to manifest itself. And the reason it's yet to manifest itself is because nobody has allowed the wound to breathe or bleed or do, it hasn't allowed it to go through its process. Because what we did was, was we said, we remember 2009 and 10, we're not gonna let that happen again. How do we solve that problem now? Well, we look back and we say, well, how do we solve it? Oh, I remember we threw millions and trillions and billions of dollars at it because money solves everything. Or does it is the question. So in our COVID situation around real estate, what they said was, is here's what we're going to do. We're not going to let anybody lose their house. We're going to do the best we can around unemployment. So what we're going to do is we're going to put $3 trillion into the economy without any transference of goods and services. So let's say that again. We'll put $3 trillion into the economy without any transference of goods and services. Fundamentals. If I get paid, if I get money in my hand, it's because I either knew something, did something, gave something, grew something, made something. I did something for it. So when we didn't do that, we put a Band-Aid over the COVID uh, crisis in the sense of what we'll do is, is we'll put forbearances in place. You don't have to pay your mortgage. Well, that just expired, as you know, here in Massachusetts. Yeah, you don't, flooding you can't the courts. <laughs> right, flooding the court system. You, you can't evict tenants in Massachusetts. You can't evict your tenants um, because we've got a moratorium on evictions. They just lifted that in Massachusetts. So what does all of that mean? Well, basically what it means is COVID has created a mass exodus of, of population from our inner cities. If you wanna go rent an apartment in New York City right now, there's plenty. If you wanna go rent an apartment in Boston, in the Back Bay, around any of the colleges, there's plenty. So those properties, now in our marketplace, we, come, we, don't, we don't do business, we don't buy in New England and, and New Jersey yet. We will probably in 18 months. <laughs> We're not buying here now because the capitalization rates are still shrunk. But as we get to see evictions actually get through the court system in New England, New York, New Jersey, when we get to see the, you know, the forbearances come to fruition, because the bank will at some point say, time to pay up. Okay, you gotta pay. You, you don't just not pay forever. It doesn't work that way. So the bubble that's bursts. the bubble bursts, Rick. We're gonna see the um, we're gonna see that population that was a homeowner population now become a renter population. So do, do you as an investor, as an intelligent commercial real estate investor, do you have the product to serve the demand? So what we did was, is the COVID crisis for us will be, will be manifested um, the most profitably now in the, in the Gulf Coast region of Florida, which is where we invest. Because in the Gulf Coast region of Florida, you have the highest population of FHA forbearances nationwide. And what that means is the lower priced single family homes, the 150s to 200, 250s, which are nice houses in the Florida market, right? Yeah. Compare that to New York, New England, you know, you can't get a you can't get an outhouse for that amount of money, <laughs> right? So those houses have the highest um, delinquency um, in in uh, in FHA mortgages. So we anticipate that being our next uh, renter population. Can't afford their mortgages, but they can afford their $850,000 a month um, rents. Now, 
Here's where it gets interesting. One might say, you're crazy, man. Everybody's losing their jobs down there. You're absolutely right. But we will not, as a society, allow you know, a 6% of our population to become homeless. We'll do what the good governor of Massachusetts decided to do, Charlie Baker, and he allocated $173 million of capital for eviction processes, for homeless programs, for new rent stabilization programs, for, you know, we the live in the- rent subsidies, yeah. That's right, rent yeah. subsidies. So yeah. as an investor, Let's just be honest. I don't care who pays my rent as long as it gets what? Yeah. Hey. And, and, you know, the, the thing is that it, it, this isn't something for the everyday show to be able to do because, yes, the, all these apartments will now be uh, rented and you'll probably have su rent subsidy. But if you don't know how to manage those type of properties. Oh, you mean uh, it's not you, easy, right? You could end up losing <laughs> your shirt as well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, so look, it's it's yeah. not really for someone that is, uh, you know, say, oh, let me just throw five million dollars into an apartment complex and I'll just collect my rents. No, it's not that easy. I'm, I've got a property right now. It's a hundred and how many doors was it? We've got so many on the block. I think this was a hundred and seven, a hundred and seven doors. And this particular complex. No, that's a different one. This was a 40 unit complex. It was built in, I think, 2018, somewhere around there. And the investor has never, ever been to his own complex because what he did was, was he bought purely off of the, the sales technique of the developer who built the 40-unit complex. And he said, oh, it's brand new. Don't worry about it. You'll be fine. Two years later, we've got it on our sales sheet right now, like it's coming through our funnel. And it's coming in at 15% less than what this guy paid for it two years ago because he has no management skills. He doesn't know how to, to, to deal with the, the tenant population. He doesn't know how to keep them happy. He doesn't know how to raise their rents properly. He doesn't, if you say to him what's deferred maintenance, he has no idea what the term even means. So, you know, commercial real estate investing, I was, I was talking to um, an attorney who lives in my neighborhood. He's a, um, an injury attorney, real nice guy. And he was contemplating coming in and investing wait, in the Wait, wait, you fund. said an injury attorney and a nice guy? Oh. Yeah, there's one. There's one no, or two of them out one. there. One lives in my neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> but he was, you know, most of our conversations for our investors are around the two hundred fifty to five hundred thousand mark. So it's not, you know, it's not a, a twenty dollar loan and pay me on Friday, right? So I was I was presenting the, the you know property management and accelerating the uh, the net operating income and blah 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 blah. And I'm giving him the full presentation. And as I'm, as I'm on this call with you, man, he, he had a deer in the headlights look. And I said, Kevin, what's, what's up? He's like, dude, I have no idea what you're talking about. He said, I'm an exceptional attorney. I can give you tort law all day long. He said, I can, I can present a case. I can defend my clients. I can go after the bad guys. He said, I got that covered. He said, what are you talking about? And I'm, I'm like, what do you mean? You know? And then he looked at me and he said, oh, I get it. I get it. He said, this is like your TV show, Flipping Boston, only it's on steroids, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, yeah, you're absolutely right. You cannot, you cannot buy a complex thinking it's just going to work itself. Every single asset that we bring into the fund has its own individual business plan. It's like having, you know, if you've got 20 apartment complexes in a fund like ours, our investors own a piece of every one of those complexes, yet every one of those complexes has their own business plan. Whether And we call it Core Plus. And basically what that means is, is we take an asset, we might do some deferred maintenance, fluff and buff the kitchen's bathrooms, no heavy lifting. If it needs a new roof, we'll do a new roof. We don't do anything that's, that's um, heavy in the sense of repair. Plus, we only buy properties 1990 or newer. They're called B-class assets. Um, we look for a certain capitalization rate. We look for a certain occupancy. We, and here's what's, what's so interesting, because your point is so, so strong. COVID has crushed the dreams and the abilities of all of these mom and pop organizations that buy these, these smaller apartment complexes that we invest in. It's crushed them because they were, they were running their business 
in an amateur fashion. You know, it's not, it's not moral, it's just business sense. And they're running these things on such a tight margin that as soon as they, they, they hit a bump in the road, they can't do it. Right. Real estate is easy when it's just going in that direction. Okay? <laughs> And that's right? not, and that's not the it. nature of the business. It goes up and it goes down. And it goes back down again. So, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing our inbound calls for these kinds of assets. Um, they're blown up. I mean, I have no outbound marketing for my acquisitions at all right now. I don't, I don't need to. They're all coming in to us. Right. And the reason we're getting the calls is because we've been doing it in that market for over 20 years now. And when something goes sideways in one of these complexes, the brokers and the owners say, hey, call, call the guys at Freedom Venture Investments. Walter Novicki the guy who can buy that. So it's, it's, it's crazy. Well, we're running tight on time. So let me just – and this is a quick explanation, Dave. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, you said, you said uh, I could talk. Oh, I know. <laughs> but, you know, the people, we want to make it so the people will listen and, and call you. <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Pri private equity fund and REIT. Sure. A REIT. Uh, so just, uh, so people ahead. understand what the difference is. Yeah, yeah. Very, a lot of people are very familiar with um, real estate investment trusts. Um, and those are publicly traded on the stock market where somebody can put in a smaller amount of capital and say, hey, I'm benefiting from real estate. The thing with a, with a, a publicly traded REIT is it's kind of interesting because the value of that REIT is not dependent on the value of the real estate. It's, it's dependent upon the fluctuations in the market, number one. So it's really not um, you know, stabilized against sticks and bricks. The other thing that I found very interesting is, is let's say we're in the same REIT, you and I, Rick, you put in, I don't know, 50,000, I put in 50,000. <laughs> A REIT legally can pay your, your distributions out of my $50,000 and vice versa. So again, it's not based on the value of the actual assets inside of it. So that's a publicly traded REIT. We're a private equity fund. You can think of us as a private REIT, if you will, a real estate investment trust. Everything that we do is based off of the value of the real estate. That's how we project um, all, of our, um, all of our targeted returns to our investors. And as I said before, if, if, you're, if, you, you, know, if you want to own real estate and do absolutely nothing, then this is the way to do it. You come in with us, you own a piece of our company. And in return for that, you own a piece of the company's assets, which is all of the real estate inside of it. So we make the real estate more valuable. That way the investors get a better rate of return. Okay. That was pretty That's good. great, Dave. Uh, if, uh, we're talking with Dave Seymour. He's a CEO of Freedom Venture Investments, Inc. Also a former, a former, I should say former because the show's not on anymore unless you go to Amazon Prime. Uh, that's former star of a and E's TV show, Flipping Boston. Also a host of a real estate revealed. Uh, that's the name of the radio show, I guess. Yeah, real, real estate, estate revealed. revealed. Yep, yep. Uh, yep. Which is on Saturdays, 12 to 1 p.m. on North Shore on channel 104.9 FM. And Dave, if someone wanted to get in touch with you, how would they do so? Well, you can reach out to us at freedomventure.com, uh, freedomventure.com. Um, if, if you're listening to this in the Florida market, you can reach out to us um, in our Fort Myers offices at 239-785-3299. If you're listening in New England on the North Shore and you want to reach uh, our offices here, you could call us at 781-922-4418, or as I said, info at freedomventure.com. That's another way to get a hold of us. Um, put in some information, and one of our uh, private equity specialists will uh, reach back out to you. And your website also is on your backdrop. Right yeah, it is. You. Look, at, look at that. <laughs> right there. That's all you got to do. Just go there. All right, you'll find us. Hey, Dave, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. A lot of great information. I hope people do reach out to find out a little bit more about investing with you. And I want to wish you a happy, uh, what is it, Monday? Happy Monday. It's Monday. No, it's, yeah. yeah, it's Monday. Yeah, it's happy Monday. Monday and stay safe. Thanks, brother. Take care. Thank you for watching today's interview. If you'd like to be a guest, a sponsor, or even advertise in the New England Real Estate Journal, 
You'll find our contact information in the description box below. You can also find all our social media platforms so you can follow us. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel.